one of the themes from the past couple of episodes that we've been talking about is the importance of memory and the ways that memory can influence not only our individual behavior, but also societal customs and even our conception of history. As such, there are many facets of memory. Regret and grief are aspects of memory certainly worth exploring, but there is also a happiness and a joy that comes from the role of positive memories. And sometimes nostalgia can be a mix of both of these positive and negative characteristics where there is a twinge of sadness, but you also feel a fleeting moment of happiness that you were able to put your finger on, maybe for only a moment, before you realize that whatever it is, is long in the past. So our relationship to the past is complicated, and obviously memory plays a huge role. And the fact that memory is fleeting and imperfect and connected to experience and place and context and all these things makes it all the more difficult to learn about our own selves, but also history and our collective identity more generally speaking. And in a similar type of way, our relationship to the future is equally mercurial and complex. What do we owe the future? What do we owe to people who haven't been born yet? How do we determine what sort of status hypothetical people or ideas or situations should merit? Could there be an equivalent of memory, which looks at the past, in terms of the future? Some might say the equivalent of memory in the future is worrying. Many of us probably worry about the future in our own personal lives, on a more grand societal scale. Worrying about the future is a whole field of philosophy and psychology in itself. This is often called existential risk. But just as memory is remembering the past, what if you could remember the future? How would that change your relationship to the world around you, the people in your life, and your own personal identity? To some extent, we all know the future. We know we are going to die and life is fleeting. As we talked about with our episode on the Kurosawa movie Ikiru, So if you buy into this philosophy, life becomes more about creating meaning for yourself and then living it out. But what if we knew more than just the end? What if we knew all of it, our whole future, beginning, middle, and end? What if we knew the whole story of our lives? Enter Ted Chang's legendary short story, called Story of Your Life. The short story is also the inspiration for the movie Arrival, starring Amy Adams, which is also excellent and well worth watching. So as always, I recommend you check out the source material in addition to the podcast, so definitely read the story by Ted Chang or watch the movie starring Amy Adams. The main character in the story is a linguist aptly named Louise, whose services are called upon when aliens suddenly arrive on Earth and the people in charge realize that they have no way of communicating with said aliens. And by the way, this piece alone makes this story worth reading and watching because it's just beautifully precise and thought-provoking and it's something as well-written and well-thought-out as this that makes you realize how incredibly silly the average movie featuring aliens actually is. I mean, think about most movies that have aliens in them. Looking at you, Marvel. Usually, the aliens just show up. Somehow, they know how to speak English. They've also somehow mastered human body language and cultural customs. In fact, they appear to be virtually identical to humans in almost every way except their skin is usually a different shade of green or red. But again, 
there is no reason why aliens from another galaxy or another universe would or should know any of this stuff. Aliens would probably have a different spoken and written language if they had language at all. They may see or hear different parts of the visual or auditory fields. They would have no understanding of our cultures. They would have no understanding of human nature or our history, etc. Ted Chang smartly points this out in his story, and that's honestly part of the fun of the story. And he surmises through the character of Louise that the only way for communication and learning to happen between humans and these aliens would be through interaction. So in the story, there's something called a looking glass that allows Louise and her colleague Gary to see and interact with the aliens who they call heptopods. In the movie, it's a little bit different, but anyway, they begin the process of trying to communicate. And when you have to start communication with a new species at the very ground floor, it's certainly an interesting thought experiment. The primacy of language to everything that we do is evident here, as both spoken and written language color everything we do. Language affects how we see the world, the level of analysis that we go through in our thoughts, the ability to articulate and explain what we are seeing. Language even helps determine how we think. Constructs concepts, cognition, all that stuff is happening to some extent at the level of language and when encountering someone or something who doesn't speak or write that language, it makes communication a huge challenge. Much of the plot and story in the short story and in the movie revolves around this sort of plot line of figuring out the best ways to communicate from the ground floor with this new alien species. But it also makes you wonder about the impact that communication or a lack of communication may have played as far as being a significant role in historical events. In the story, Louise quotes a probably fictitious but still illustrative story surrounding this point, saying, quote, In 1770, Captain Cook's ship Endeavour ran aground on the coast of Queensland, Australia. While some of his men made repairs, Cook led an exploration party and met the Aboriginal people. One of the sailors pointed to the animals that hopped around with their young riding in pouches, and ask an Aborigine what they were called. The Aborigine replied, kangaroo. From then on, Cook and his sailors referred to the animals by this word. It wasn't until later that they learned it meant, what did you say? End quote. So again, while probably wildly oversimplified and fictitious, this little account that Louise gives in the story, historically speaking, makes you wonder how things might have been different if there hadn't been communication barriers, especially at some of these flashpoint moments like Columbus's first meeting with indigenous peoples, the British and the Aborigines, Cortez and the Aztecs, just to name a few examples. Anyways, a similar type of communication barrier exists in the story, as we've already mentioned, between humans and the aliens, so... A big chunk of the story is devoted to the slow process of Luis and Gary communicating with the heptopods and beginning to learn their languages and writing systems, although it may not be fair to call it a conventional writing system, as Chang explains in the story. Now, the twist, I guess you would call it, in the story is that while this story of communication with the heptopods is happening, there's also a parallel story of Louise remembering stories of her daughter who died at age 25 in a climbing accident. And then the big twist that may not hit you until the end, depending on how perceptive you are during the movie or how perceptive you are while reading the story, 
again, it may not hit you until the end, but the idea is that Louise, when she's remembering her daughter, wasn't remembering the past. She was remembering the future. All those memories of her daughter haven't happened yet, but they will in the future. In the story, the heptapods don't experience causality the same way that we do. They experience past, present, and future all at once. One way to think about this that Ted Chang uses in the story is to think about cause and effect. As humans, we often think of causality in this way where something is moving along and then something happens to it and that creates an effect. But for the heptapods, it's more of a teleological awareness where a cause is fulfilling its purpose the best by achieving a desired effect. The cause is seeking out the effect and has a purpose in doing so, almost like cause and effect are reversed. In the story, Louise talks about how it's possible for the humans and heptapods to have different versions of cause and effect. Quote, when the ancestors of humans and heptapods first acquired the spark of consciousness, they both perceived the same physical world, but they parsed their perceptions differently. The worldviews that ultimately arose were the end result of that divergence. Humans had developed a sequential mode of awareness, while heptapods had developed a simultaneous mode of awareness. We experienced events in an order and perceived their relationship as cause and effect. They experienced events all at once and perceived a purpose underlying them all, a minimizing, maximizing purpose. End quote. As the story goes on and as Louise begins to learn the heptapod languages, she begins to think like a heptapod, and as language is integral to cognition, this begins giving her these quote-unquote memories of the future. She now knows that she is going to marry Gary, decide to have a daughter, and that that daughter would eventually have her life cut short at the age of 25 by a terrible accident. Of course, now that Louise knows this, this brings up all sorts of interesting philosophical and psychological questions related to how would your life change if you knew the future? Perhaps the first question centers around free will. Let's set aside the question of whether free will exists and instead ask the question, how would knowing the future impact free will? Would it be possible to act with your own freedom and agency if you already knew what was going to happen? Or would you merely be moving along like a puppet on a string, just constantly reading the next word in a book that's already been written? Ted Chang, through the character of Louise, talks about this dilemma with an amazing passage in the short story. Quote, Consider a person standing before the Book of Ages, the chronicle that records every event, past and future. Even though the text has been photo-reduced from the full-sized edition, the volume is enormous. With magnifier in hand, she flips through the tissue-thin leaves until she locates the story of her life. She finds the passage that describes her flipping through the Book of Ages, and she skips to the next column where it details what she'll be doing later in the day. Acting on information she's read in the book, she'll bet $100 on the racehorse Devil May Care and win 20 times that much. The thought of doing just that had crossed her mind, but being a contrary sort, she now resolves to refrain from betting on the ponies altogether. There's the rub. The Book of Ages cannot be wrong. This scenario is based on the premise that a person is given knowledge of the actual future not of some possible future. If this were Greek myth, circumstances would conspire to make her enact her fate despite her best efforts. But prophecies and myth are notoriously vague. The Book of Ages is quite specific, and there's no way she can be forced to bet on a racehorse in the manner specified. The result is a contradiction, 
The book of ages must be right, by definition, yet no matter what the book says she'll do, she can choose to do otherwise. How can these two facts be reconciled? They can't be, was the common answer. A volume like the book of ages is a logical impossibility, for the precise reason that its existence would result in the above contradiction. Or, to be generous, some might say that the book of ages could exist as long as it wasn't accessible to readers. That volume is housed in a special collection, and no one has viewing privileges. The existence of free will meant that we couldn't know the future, and we knew free will existed because we had direct experience of it. Volition was an intrinsic part of consciousness. Or was it? What if the experience of knowing the future changed a person? What if it evoked a sense of urgency? a sense of obligation to act precisely as she knew she would, end quote. If your head is spinning right now after that quote, I think it's supposed to be. And these questions of free will and hypothetical scenarios where you know the future may or may not be your thing, and many a philosophy class or many a philosophy discussion flows around these questions of free will and could you do otherwise. But as Luis points out, and perhaps the alien heptapods in the story live out, would it be possible that if you knew the future, you would act with purpose to intentionally want to fulfill the future as opposed to avoiding it or changing it? What if you developed a sense of urging and obligation to act to create the truth. So this interpretation of free will and acting to create the future dovetails nicely with the alien heptapod view of cause-effect, where the cause is actively seeking out a purpose and fulfilling that purpose by reaching the effect. At any rate, I think the free will stuff and the cause and effect thought experiments in this story are interesting, and they are the type of thing that make you think and examine your own life choices, hopefully. And it's a cool story to read twice once you know the twist, because there's a lot of Easter eggs and foreshadowing, no pun intended. But to me, the heart of the story is the relationship between Louise and her daughter. Louise knows that her daughter is going to have her life cut short by this terrible accident. And this brings up a sort of age-old dilemma about life in general. Simply put, does the good of life outweigh the bad? Do the joys and pleasures of life outweigh its sufferings? Ted Chang plays with this in some subtle ways in the story. At one point in one of Luis's memories of the future, she says, quote, It'll be when you first learn to walk that I get daily demonstrations of the asymmetry in our relationship. You'll be incessantly running off somewhere, and each time you walk into a door frame or scrape your knee, the pain feels like it's my own. It'll be like growing an errant limb, an extension of myself whose sensory nerves report pain just fine, but whose motor nerves don't convey my commands at all. It's so unfair. I'm going to give birth to an animated voodoo doll of myself. I didn't see this in the contract when I signed up. Was this part of the deal? And then there will be times when I see you laughing, like the time you'll be playing with the neighbor's puppy poking your hands through the chain-link fence separating our backyards, and you'll be laughing so hard you'll start hiccuping. The puppy will run inside the neighbor's house, and your laughter will gradually subside, letting you catch your breath. Then the puppy will come back to the fence to lick your fingers again, and you'll shriek and start laughing again. It will be the most wonderful sound I could ever imagine, a sound that makes me feel like a fountain or a wellspring. Now, if I can only remember that sound the next time your blithe disregard for self-preservation gives me a heart attack, end quote. A passage there that I think most parents will likely understand, 
But again, it illustrates this duality of life where there is happiness and joy, but there is also suffering. And it also illustrates what it's like to experience that for somebody else. So the question becomes, does the good of life, the joy, the happiness, does all of that outweigh the bad? And is life worth living even if you know that it's not going to end well? Furthermore, should you be able to make that decision for another person that you have a role in creating? Does Luis have the right to make that decision for her daughter? There are actually some people who would answer no to both of those questions, believe it or not. Maybe it would be best for humanity to simply stop procreating, opt out, and walk hand in hand into extinction, as the great Rust Cole once said. So for Rust, that's a no to the question of does the joy in life outweigh the suffering? But what I like about this story is that it seems to imply that for Ted Chang, at least, in the story of your life, the answer is yes. Yes. 